Hello and welcome to After COVID-19, What Comes Next? We are in lesson seven. Our scene is scene four, the seven signs of revelation. And this is our third lesson in the series of, um, of lesson seven. And before we get, begin, I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us, those who are here live and those who are here um, on YouTube. Thank you for being here. And I want to start with a word of prayer. So let us ask God for his blessing in this time. Dear Lord, thank you so much for another opportunity we have to deep, dig deeper into history, into your plan for us, into um, the ways that, that you are working in, in our society even today. I pray, Lord, that you will bless us and help us to honor and glorify you. May you open our eyes and our ears and our minds to, to understand um, our lesson today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we have our reviews that we're going through. And just if you'd like to find out more about our lessons, they're all online. If, you're, if you missed anything, just text me and I'll be happy to forward you the, the um, link to our, to our, missed, uh, to our past uh, studies. Here are our seven keys. And right now we are in scene four, so we're right in the middle of this seven scene series. And this is the heart and soul of the entire book of Revelation. And we're in the Ark of the Covenant, and we're right in the time of the Day of Atonement. So here comes the seven signs. Imagine, if you would, all of these happening right before you, like a giant play in our hearts, in our minds that we can see. This is supposed to be visual. This is supposed to be um, experienced, not just read about, but also imagined. And, and you're supposed to see these things unfolding. That's why it's so visual. It's supposed to be understood visually, and it's supposed to draw our attention and, and show us something. It's supposed to be engaging, not just um, not a passive experience, but an engaging experience. So we have the first sign being the the woman, excuse me, the woman and the in in the moon and the stars. Um, but we we also we made a point at the beginning of our study to share the two characteristics of God's people, of Christian people, as those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. This is important because. Um, there is going to be a very important um, religious political power that is going to take place in the future that's going to seem like an extension of Christianity, but is actually going to be caused by Satan. And it's going to be caused by Satan because um, it's going to be missing those two very important characteristics. It's, they're not going to keep the commandments of God. They're going to have their own version of the commandments of God. And they're not going to testify of Jesus. They're not going to have the spirit of Jesus, the testify of Jesus. So we have the introduction, which is the door open, which is the um, part of the Day of Atonement where God would cleanse the sanctuary of all the sins of his people. And then our first sign is the woman of the dra and the dragon. We talked about how the woman represented the people of God, the church, and um, she gives birth to Jesus, and Jesus ascends to heaven. The dragon symbolized Satan and his attack on Christianity, on, on, the, on the, those who are faithful to God throughout the generations. And um, the woman ends up fleeing into the wilderness, which in turn actually ends up being the United States and the New World. That happens, it, it provides a a place for um, faithful Christians to flee in times of persecution and religious oppression. So then we have the beast of the sea. And part of the reason why this beast has these four heads and this lion's head and this bear's head and this leopard and, and has this um, beast head with iron teeth and iron horns is a reference to the political powers of the 
of the of the world and actually it shows that this is a, a, a not just a a one being but this is a, a a movement that has taken place throughout the history of mankind this false religion that claims to be godly claims to be spiritual but is actually um a political spiritual power and um and if you'd like more information i'd be happy to explain more but it's someone that has existed for a long time we we then come to the beast of the earth and the beast of the earth looks like a lamb has two horns but speaks like a dragon and the earth you remember was uh the new world was the united states so this is a power that is going to extend from or come out of the United States or from the New World in some time in the future. Um, part of the bad things about what this beast does is it causes people to lose to worship the the image of this beast, which is going to cause, which means people are going to lose their religious freedom. It gives breath to the image of the beast, which creates a spiritual institute. It creates a political social a, a political religious uh organization that's going to persecute people it's going to kill those who don't worship so it's going to have religious persecution Oop. i meant to anyways Ca it causes them to receive the mark of the beast so this is going to be the the being that forces us to to receive the mark of the beast and there's going to be no more freedom of commerce. So um, we talk a little bit about the image of the beast. The mark of the beast, we remember, we, we, we always think about, oh no, it's going to be a tattoo that people have to wear. Or, it's, oh man, it's going, to be, it's going to be a chip that people implant in our minds, in our, in our, in our, in our in our brains or in our hands and um that's that's really not where our focus should be the the real however it turns out the mark of the beast is going to be basically a choice it's going to be a choice whether we serve god or whether we serve man and so this is going to force us to have to choose am i going to choose to follow man's laws even though it contradicts what the bible teaches just in order to maintain safety security you know people are going to be killed if they don't have it if they don't make this choice people are going to be um lose the they're going to lose the right to buy or sell which um that is scary because how are you going to provide for your family if you can't buy or sell anything how are you going to provide for um uh, buy Christmas presents if you can't even go to the store without having this mark and so it's going to be very difficult people are either going to go with it even though they don't agree with it just in order to be able to provide those things or they're going to buy into it which is the difference between the hand and the and the forehead is the difference between conscious a, a conscious decision or a practical decision where one in the mark on the forehead is a decision out of that is spurned out of belief one is a spurned out of convenience but both are, are essentially the same it's like you're you're getting a mark on your hand and your forehead basically you're making a decision to go against god in order to preserve your own convenience or your own satisfaction so that's why it's important for us to now while things are good while everything is 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 uh peaceful even though we know that the world isn't peaceful at this time but while it's more peaceful than it than it will be in the future now is the time for us to prioritize our relationship with god above anything else in our lives so now we're today we're coming to the 144,000. so it says then i looked and behold the lamb standing on mount zion and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads and i heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder and i heard the sound of harpists playing their harps 
they sang as if as it were a new song before the throne before the four living creatures and the elders and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 sorry Forty-four thousand who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, and they were without fault before the throne of God. So, uh, let's see. Okay. Let me just go back a little bit. So <laughs> uh, we always we've we've talked a little bit about the hundred and forty four thousand. What does the hundred and forty four thousand mean? Um, are these the people that are already in heaven? We saw the hundred and forty four thousand in the throne with God, and we saw the hundred forty four thousand with um, with several prophecies now. And we've talked a little bit about that. You know, we could say, well, they're the virgin. So that means that um, it doesn't include everyone. It just includes the 144,000 people who, who are redeemed before they, they have sex. And, and not to be crude or anything, but um, we have to understand that this is a spiritual thing. This is not talking about physical anything. This is talking about a spiritual representation. So we can't read it that way and say, well, uh, only 144,000 virgins are going to go to heaven and the rest of us will go later or something like that. This is talking about spiritual, spiritual condition, a, a condition of their heart, which is to say people who, um, who are pure in, in relation to their obedience to God. Whenever God uh, compared uh, sexuality to something he was comparing it to um, religious um, faithfulness whenever his his um, people would follow other gods they would be said to be really um, spiritually um, cheating on God they would be they would be unfaithful to him they would be it would be counted as a sexual sin in, in a sense of of um, being unfaithful and impure and 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 following other idols and other gods and so when it's talking about 144,000 virgins it's talking about 144,000 people who are pure and who are faithful to God they're the ones that we talked about who are the real followers who are faithful to God in obeying God and having the testimony of Jesus but we also saw that in the past, John said 144,000 and then said that their number was uncountable. And one of the explanations for this is that the actual dimensions of the New Jerusalem add up to 144,000. If you, if you do volume, there's about 144,000. Um, that, that's how much space is. And I would say it's, uh, miles, but it's, I think it's cubits. Um, but 144,000 is, is a way of saying, it, it could be interpreted as saying those who are part of the New Jerusalem. It's not a literal number because we've seen it where John will say there was 144,000 and then he looks upon them and they are uncountable. So um, he already counted them. Why would he say they're uncountable? If there were 144,000, then that's how many there are. But it seems that there's more than that, that this is a number that represents a remnant people of God. So these are the people that while the world is deciding, while the world is making these grand decisions of this religious political party, of this, of this beast and of, of putting this mark, these are the people who, instead of receive the mark of Satan, the mark of the beast, they receive the seal of God, 
And if you notice, the seal of God doesn't go on the hand. It only goes on the forehead. So it's something that has to come out of our own personal choice. You can't go along with it out of convenience. You have to choose to be sealed by God. You have to choose God, which means rejecting the, um, the, the mark of the beast. Even at our own peril, these are the people who, who decide to be sealed by God. And another way of using it, this is actually speaking directly about the remnant of God. There have always been a remnant of God, and there's always been a people of God that were faithful to him. And, um, and the characteristics of the remnant people is that they follow the commandments of God, and they keep the testimony of Jesus. That's what it means to be a remnant. If you would like more information about that, I encourage you to read a very important book called The Great Controversy, which actually goes into what remnant means and how history shows that we're what remnant means because remnant has been found throughout throughout the time of uh, even in the time of Israel there was a remnant even in the time of Martin Luther there was a remnant in our day it's a very specific and a very focused remnant but um, we're going to see that that it, it's um, it's it's true this remnant is uh, are a group of people that are taking on the call of Jesus, but it's also um, uh, not just one group of people, but it's everyone that follows the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. So there's a little bit of a dual meaning. There is a, a remnant movement, and there is a remnant that is greater than the remnant movement. But the remnant movement is the one that's going to be responsible for the three angels' message. So um, let's see, what does a seal of God mean? So a seal of God has to be what uh, has to contain three things. It has to contain the name of the person, the title, and the territory. That was what an official seal meant right so so what could be the seal of god in the last days let's look at what exodus 20 verse 8 through 11 says remember to observe the sabbath day by keeping it holy you have six days free for your ordinary work but the seventh day is the sabbath of rest dedicated to the lord your god on that day no one in your household may do any work this includes your sons, your daughters, your male servants, your female servants, your livestock, and any foreigner living among you. For in six days, the Lord, which in the original language actually uses um, his, his real name, which many, um, many uh, people will translate as Jehovah. And they'll translate it as Jehovah because the Jewish people thought it was so holy that they would not even um, pronounce the word. They would they would uh, use Adonai or Elohim, but they would not use the actual word. And that word, which we we kind of interpret today as being Yahweh, um, but that's that was the title. So there is his title. Um, made in the heavens, the earth, the sea, that's his domain, and everything in them. But on the Sabbath day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the seventh Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. So we see that the Sabbath is actually a very important part of God's people. In fact, um, the Sabbath was, was sent in Ezekiel, it says that the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people that, that they follow him and they believe in him. Um, and if we remember, I, I had the I had the quote, but I, I ended up deleting it from this slide because I wanted to focus on other things. But that was one of the things that the Catholic Church, Church boasted about was that they said, well, we uh, changed it because we wanted to show our authority and being able to change things from 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 the Bible, and so we decided to change uh, Sabbath from Saturday, the seventh day, which is 
God's blessed day that he set apart to Sunday. And so it seems that in the future, what we might be looking at is an actual um, mandated day of, of worship. And we're already seeing this happening in different conversations. People are hinting about this and saying, well, um, why it, everybody would benefit from a day of rest? Why don't we force businesses and force people to stop doing any business on Sunday and we can make Sunday the day of rest? And that's fine. Who cares? If, if people don't want to work on Sunday or they want to worship God, it's, diff it's fine. But when you start to persecute people who are following the word of God and trying to follow um, this mandate or this command, then it becomes an issue because then you are um, just, uh, ignoring the word of God, which we're trying to be faithful to in order to form a, a completely different thing. So this is something that we look at and I can interpret as what this means that um, in this time, there's going to be um, a, a choice that we're going to have to make regarding the, our day of worship. Are we going to um, follow this uh, law that is forcing us to do to to worship on on Sunday, in spite of our own convictions, in spite of what the Bible says, or are we going to be faithful to the Word of God? And, and follow the word of God, even though it, it causes us to lose out or causes us to, um, to miss, to, to be disconnected from the rest of society and to the point where we might even be persecuted and killed for, for holding on to that. Is it so valuable that we'd be willing to die? Or would we make a compromise and say, well, I can... I can pretend to go this way and I'll really worship in my heart on Saturday. Well, that's where the mark on the hand comes because there's going to be a lot of people who, who go along with it thinking, well, even though I'm, I'm receiving the mark on my hand, even though I'm, I'm making this decision, I'm still faithful to, I'm still faithful to the, to the spirit of God's commandment, even if I'm not obeying it, but the, what they don't realize is just because you got it on your hand doesn't mean that you're exempt or that, or that you missed out. You got it on your hand. It's the same as getting it on your forehead. You're still making a decision to do something that goes against God and that, and that um, is a direct disobedience to God. So then we come to the three angels. And these three angels, uh, we talked about this. We always think, oh, the three angels, the three angels. Oh man, um, so these are going to be people, or these are going to be beings that are going to be calling out in the middle. This is a symbolic book. So we're not going to be looking for three literal angels flying through heaven. This is going to be three messages, three movements that are, are resounding through, uh, through people. People are going to be giving these messages. We shouldn't be expecting angels to give this message. These are for messengers that are delivering this message to the world, to the people around us. So the first angel comes, and let's read what it says. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So all of a sudden, um, does, does this ring any bells to you? So this is a, uh, a being that is, um, this is a message to worship God, to return to our worship of God. And this is happening um, in time, this is supposed to be happening as people are deciding whether to receive the seal of God or receive the seal of, of, the, of the beast, the mark of the beast. 
And this is going to be a call to return back to worship God as our creator, as our redeemer. So this is going to be a worship of the true God, of worshiping God as our creator and, and leaving the false worship behind. And one of the things is interesting is that it asks us to worship God specifically not as a God the most powerful or God the most wise or the most intelligent, but God as our creator. Um, so it's worshiping, worshiping God as with his authority as creator. And that is actually one of the um, main focuses of the Sabbath is to worship God as our creator. So uh, this might be a, a calling back to people to worship God on the Sabbath. This is also a call to worship God, to, to, to lay aside false worship, false Christianity, false, false understandings, and return to worshiping God. Leave the, the God of money and leave the God of ambition. Leave all those things behind and worship God as, um, as we have been shown to worship him through the bible so um this this is shown through the the messages that um that we have been called through the bible to to preach about and um oh sorry i, I'm, I lost my notes for a second um this is uh the day of atonement talking about um choose you this day who you will serve and this is the time right before um the the time of atonement is done what happens when the day of atonement is done while while we understand the 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 day of atonement now and we talk about 1844 and the the way that jesus went from the holy place to the most holy place and what that sim means, you know, how that means that now Jesus is purifying us from our sins and he's, he's solidifying, he's kind of cementing our, our decisions. He is, he is cleansing the sanctuary. All those who have passed, who had, who had believed in Jesus as their Savior, now he is um, getting rid of their sins in the in the most holy place um and um and he's helping he's he's um addressing their needs of salvation and there's going to be a time where he's done and when he's done the the spirit of god when this priest was done with the day of atonement the Spirit of God would actually go into the holy place and fill up the holy place where then no one else could enter into the holy place, meaning from there on, there will be no more atonement for our sins. So those who at that time have decided to follow Jesus, decided to receive the righteousness of Jesus, will be, will be completely sealed, will be completely um solidified in their decision there won't be any going back and forth um and the same will be for the other side those who have chosen against god will be sealed and they won't be able to um turn back from their own choices so then the second angel comes along and says another angel followed saying babylon is fallen it's fallen the great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of her wrath of her fornication so um what is the message there well babylon is no longer around but the spirit of babylon has existed way before the 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 actual nation of babylon the actual kingdom of babylon existed and it's actually existed way after the kingdom of babylon has existed and it is started out as the tower of babel 
Babylon actually comes from the word Babel, and Babel actually comes from the word confusion. Ba the Tower of Babel was um, a group of people after the flood who, instead of fearing God and saying, okay, let's obey God and let's keep doing what the Bible tells us and let's keep doing what God asks us to do and let's learn our lesson so that we don't ever have to experience a flood again. Even after God had promised Noah that he would never flood the earth again, you had this group of people who remained defiant to God and their, their decision was, instead of saying, all right, I'm gonna change my life, their decision was, I'm going to build a tower that's so tall and so massive that God won't be able to kill us if he ever, if we ever decide, if he ever decides that we've gotten to that point again. In other words, I, it's not about my sin. I'm going to get away with it. I'm going to try to do what I can to get away with it. So this idea of Babylon, um, that's by the way where God came down and confused all the languages and sent people out into different corners and people ask well why that doesn't seem fair i mean they were all they were just building a tower that's all it is what we don't understand is how how our sinfulness impacts other people you know you look at um what they say sin traveling for generation to generation and you look at um you, you, you see it where the, the, the kid comes out just like their parent. Well, what happens when you have a good kid that ends up making friends with some bad kids? Um, do, you, do you ever like think, oh, okay, well, that'd be fine. They'll be a good influence on, on the bad kids. No, honestly, it's, it's unfortunate, but too often the people who are bad often have a worse influence on good people and end up taking people away from their good habits and their good mentalities and so when you have people that are so unified and so connected to one another who are continuously becoming more and more wicked and more and more evil society as a whole becomes um just corrupted and and horrible and just and becomes more and more evil in everything that goes on so God didn't destroy them, but he kind of um, gave the world more time by dividing us into different uh, languages. What he actually ended up doing was um, allowing us to have less unity and less horrible influence on each other and allowed the world to kind of develop for a longer period of time without that sickness of sin corrupting the world. So um, that the city of Babylon is actually a representation of this group of people who are, are kind of wanting or who, who have the desire to, to rebel against God, to do their own thing, um, you know, we're hearing things in the news about different people in high society and, you know, about uh, people who are being arrested for all kinds of horrible things. And you think about how many people of influence could be involved in these really horrible uh, rings, this wealth rings. And uh, you think about how many people had to squish uh, and take advantage of and, and cheat and rob uh, people in order to become wealthy. And you think about there's, there's two, there's really two um, worlds that we live in. You have the, the good world that is just trying to do their best and God fearing. And you have this other world of people who are so focused on self and about their own satisfaction that um, they kill, they, they take advantage, they, they steal and they, they ruin the world for their own greatness and their own benefit. And, and they're so selfishly minded and they're so rebellious against God and against all of, all of God's laws 
um, that that all they do is is destroy and corrupt and 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 harm. And um, and in a sense, that's that's exactly what Babylon is 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 this group of people who are so self focused and so rebellious against God that they do everything they can to to avoid his laws. And and God promises that in this time, this world economic uh, connection, this this rebellious uh, force is going to be is going to fall, is going to lose, and um, and that could be speaking about an economic um, economic uh, turmoil. That could be talking about um, any kind of global event that disrupts our, 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 our trade markets, our, our working together, all those things that people put their trust in. They put their trust in the stock market. They put their trust in politics and all those things. There's going to be something that destroys that worldly work, that worldly operation that is going around in all countries and all over the world. And and that there's going to be something that destroys that um, that power stru structure, that that rebellious, selfish, destructive um, world power that is is having so much influence and is drawing so many people away from God. That is going to be destroyed um, before the second coming. It says, and the nations were angry, and their wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints, and them the fear of the name, small and great, and should destroy them who destroy the earth. God, good people care about justice for the poor, but the wicked are not concerned. As Christians, we are called to be caring about not not about how rich we can get, not about how well our home should be, but how are we interacting and, and benefiting and blessing the world around us. That's the thing that makes the the uh, city of Babylon and the people of God different. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming to you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their co corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay. The workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. They have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. In the same sense of, of Jesus casting people out in the temple as the image shows, in the sense of, of people thinking, oh, how long can people take advantage of others and, and really take the blood out of people and and destroy people and get away with it. And these people who have valued their own luxury, their own wealth, their own their own selfish ambitions over the over the needs of others will one day have to pay for every bad decision that they made in every way that they destroyed the earth or ignore the needs of others. So we don't have time to go through this, but um, let's read the third angels. Uh, message, and then we'll talk about it in the next week or so. Then a third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, who and whoever receives the mark of his name. So again, this is all this is happening before the official mark of the beast 
So these are three messages that are going to go out into the world um, before the day of probation, before the end of our time to choose. And, um, and we will talk about the third angel's message more in detail next week. And we will continue with the seven signs. But we have come to the end of our, of our time today. And I just want to thank you all for being here and for joining us. And let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time. I pray, Lord, that as the temptations of the world draw us and as we think about how much money we can make and how much better our lives will be with so many things, a new car, a new this, a new that, may we always remember that the Babylon is destined to fall, that um, these things in this world are temporary. May we focus our attention on you, Lord, and may we um, make... Uh, the decision today to to observe, to follow your commandments, to, to be faithful to your commandments and to give the testimony of Jesus, that while there is still time and while we can still make a firm decision, that we will not be swayed. Let us decide today who we will serve and may we continue to work for your honor and glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.